Amen. Okay, well, <clears throat> what I want to talk to today, to you, if I can, and I've, Joe told me I've got 40 minutes, so, because of live streaming. So, hello everyone on live streaming. So, hopefully you'll get to the end. I've got four points. What I wanted to talk to today, I want to talk to you about the anointing, but I wanted to talk to you in the context of like <clears throat> um, what the church fathers have said in that uh, I gave a talk uh, not too long ago on a, a talk called Sober Intoxication of the Holy Spirit, the early church fathers, how the fourth century of the church was a time where there was just an incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What we'd say today is like similar to the charismatic renewal. The church was charismatic. And in that time, they wrote many things. And one is uh, they wrote a lot on the anointing, what we would call today on the anointing. And I wanted to uh, sort of talk about it. And I, first I wanted to ask the question was, what is, what is it to be anointed? Because many of us today in charismatic circles hear that, you know, flung around, or oh, he's anointed, he, whatever, he, she's anointed or whatever. Funnily enough, with the anointing, the anointing is completely different to someone's gifting. They marry together, but they're different. So someone can be highly gifted, but they might not be anointed because the anointing's a lot different than the gifting. Now, if they marry together, it's good, but the anointing is a different thing. So I want to look at it, and primarily how you find what the anointing is is when you look at the life of Jesus. But I've just got four points that I want to go through. The first is consecration. The second is the anointing in Jesus' life. The third is the anointing in our lives. And the last is what the anointing does in our lives. So firstly, I just want to read a scripture. Um, this is the, the, the scripture I'll read for the day. It's, it's um, reading from 1 Corinthians 2.4. And it's from Paul's message. Paul says, uh, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Amen? Amen. Now, I just want to read a quote. This sort of quote helps me set it up. Now, this a lot of this is from um, Reniero Cantalamessa's uh, book on sober intoxication, and uh, I've gleaned a lot of it from that. So you can find it in his book, some of it. Some of it's from me. But it, this is a quote from Augustine, and he said, Let us rejoice and give thanks that we have not only become Christians, but Christ himself. Wow. Do you understand and grasp, brethren, God's grace towards us? Marvel and rejoice. We have become Christ. For he is the head and we are the members. He and we together are the whole man. The fullness of Christ then is the head and the members. But what does head and members mean? Christ and the church. Now, everything the church does is to do with the Holy Spirit. The church cannot do anything without the Holy Spirit's presence and His anointing. Everything He calls us to, yes, He calls us to do it with Him because Christ and the church are one. And the Holy Spirit flows through Christ, the Lordship of Jesus Christ, through His anointing and His presence that flows into the church and it empowers the church to carry on the ministry of Christ. Amen? Amen. So in saying that, what I sort of felt was God wanted to release over us. He wants to, I just felt like he wanted to encourage us, you know, to be open. Oh, I just spilled water. Sorry. <laughs> to be, lucky, nothing's there. To be open to what God has for us and just to encourage us to be open to God and his presence and his love for us. But in the first centuries of the church, um, what happened was the week that followed Easter was a time when the bishop presented. Now, here's a good word for my, myself. I might have said it here before. Now, I'm not an educated person. I have no formal education. So sometimes when I find a word, I like to play with it a little bit. Uh, and this word's called mystagogical catechesis. Whoa. It's pretty good, isn't it? Mystagogical catechesis. And it, what it means is this. It means... It was so, what it does, it's introducing people to the mysteries of the faith. And what happened was, in the early church after Easter, after people got filled with the Holy Spirit, 
after they were baptized, what happened? The bishop had come and he'd teach them what had happened to them. Because now, instead of being intoxicated with themselves, all of a sudden they were intoxicated with the Holy Spirit and they were overcome by the presence of God. They came out of paganism. They left their gods behind. They left their life behind. And all of a sudden they came into this experience of this deification of the life of God coming into their soul and energising them with the love of God. And what the bishop used to do for seven days after that process, he'd teach them what had happened to them because they couldn't understand the experience of what had happened. And I've got a quote from one of these, uh, from a bishop there. But Tertullian referred to it, he, he, he wrote, when he wrote that the converts from paganism seem to be overwhelmed at such light and truth. They were so overcome by the life of God. And he quotes that uh, scripture from 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn infants who long for pure spiritual milk so that they may grow into salvation. So one of the mysteries that was explained during that week was that of the anointing. And there's an extract from this mystagogical uh, teaching and it's attributed to Cyril of Jerusalem. So Cyril was in about 348, so it's a... Uh, that in that fourth century. And he says this, he says, baptised in Christ and clothed in Christ. This is extraordinary. Baptised in Christ and clothed in Christ, you have assumed a nature similar to that of the Son of God. You are properly called Christ. That is consecrated because God has said of you, do not touch my anointed ones. Now that word consecrated there and the anointing are synonymous. Wherever you see the word anointing is the, the, the word consecration. They're both the same. That is consecrated because God has said of you, do not touch my anointed ones. You were consecrated when you received the sign of the Holy Spirit. Baptised in the River Jordan, Christ emerged from the water and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. The same thing happened to you. The soul, when you received the Holy Spirit, the soul became sanctified by the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. So what happened was when they received the Holy Spirit, Cyril says that they received a nature similar to that of the Son of God, that the life of God now was infused in the soul and they became like in nature to God. Extraordinary, isn't it? That God now became their life and their strength. The soul now became energised by the presence of God. And the word consecration there has this understanding that when you're consecrated, you're set apart for God for a particular purpose. Now, in saying I wanted to look at four points, the first point that I wanted to look at was that of the anointing and consecration. Um, and what happens in consecration. When God consecrates us, he separates us for him for two reasons. There's, a, there's this separation that happens. So when God anoints us with his Holy Spirit, he, he pours his life into us and we're separated for two things, for worship and service. So what sets God's people apart from everyone else is the, the um, worship and and service. What worship does, it brings us into the presence and the life of God where we experience His grace and His life in us and our soul becomes deified like Him and we're, st we're empowered by His <clears throat> grace to fulfil what He has asked us to do. Amen? I've got water everywhere up here. So worship, the same is um, worship and service. When you see this word anointing, there's this interesting thing. You see this, uh, what happens is that God separates a people um, from everything else and appoints them for worship and service. So a question we can ask ourselves is if we're anointing by the Holy Spirit, how much has it affected us, who we worship? Now, why, why it's important is because our spirits were created for union with God. 
We were never created self-sufficient beings. It was God's will. God's will created us and God created us to sustain us only in his presence. And from the fallen nature, what happened? Our soul became separated from the life of God. So now when we went within ourselves, the presence of God wasn't within us. Before the fall, what happened was there was this amazing gift we had called integrity. And what happened with that gift? Our soul was subordinate to God's spirit in our, in our life. And the life of God flooded into our soul and reflected in our body by our deeds. And what happened after the fall, that gift of integrity was never, never came back and we were separate from the life of God. But in Jesus Christ now, in Jesus Christ, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what happens, the life of God is now in the soul and what happens is that gift was not replaced, that gift of integrity where our spirit is subordinate to God. But what happens now through the grace of the Holy Spirit, we can activate that by our will, by our will, by our choice. So Paul talks about in Romans chapter 2, or Romans 8 verse 2, he talks about the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. So Paul talks about now there's two laws at work in me, the law of the spirit, the law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life is the Holy Spirit in my soul. Isn't that incredible? That the whole of God lives in me. And he talks about yielding. Are we going to yield to the law of the spirit of life or do we yield to the law of sin and death? And what worship does, worship brings us to a place where our soul is integrated under the presence of God. And when our soul is integrated under the presence of God, the life of God flows into us through our spirit, into our soul, and we're raised up like him. We become like him. Now, this is where, like Cyril said, when you were baptised, you assumed a nature similar to that of the Son of God. That's the potential in us. The potential in us is the presence of God living in us. The life of God's in us and it's activated in us by our choice. Do we yield to the Holy Spirit living in us or do we yield to ourselves? Now, I ask myself this question. Am I more aware of the Holy Spirit in me or am I more aware of myself? Because what I'm aware of is where I put my eyes. And the Scripture gives an overall arching theme about what we look at what we worship, we become like. And where we put our eyes, if I look at myself, all I see is my limitations. And when I see my limitations, I give that power over me because that tells me who I am. And that's a lie of who I am. I've assumed a nature similar to that of the Son of God. And as I put my eyes on Jesus, and this is worship, as I fix my eyes on him, I start to become all that he is through the integration of my soul and my spirit. Do you understand that? It's pretty, it's a little bit, uh, might be a little bit deep, but I start to become like him. So worship is the integration of my spirit, soul and body under the spirit of God. When I put my eyes on him, I start to receive his life. And service is, re is the reflection of God's life in my body through good deeds. Paul says in the end, we'll be judged by our deeds. So we're judged by the things we do on the body because what we do on the body is what we reflect in our soul. So if I align myself to God, I start to move in love over my neighbour. But if I align myself to myself, I start to operate in selfishness and self-centeredness and I'm cut off from the life of God. If I align myself outside of God's law, I align myself to demonic power and I start to be controlled by demonic power. But Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death by himself coming and living inside of me. Now the whole of God lives in me. Isn't that incredible? The whole of God. Because God's a spirit, he can't give himself a little bit to you. He has to give the whole of himself to you and the whole of God lives inside you. So the potential of Jesus Christ is in all of us. So consecrated people enter into a relationship of God that is special than anybody else. Consecration then is an act by which we are made holy. 
Anointed people are made like God. We take on his nature. So the anointing with um, oil, as was symboled in the scriptures and consecration, was that symbol. When someone was anointed with oil, um, it was an act of consecration, that they were separate to God for worship and service. The worship brought them into the likeness of God because now the presence of God started to flow in and through them. So what does it mean for the Christian to be anointed or consecrated? What kind of anointing have they received? Okay, second point is Christ the anointed one. Um, we need to find what the anointing is. It's really good if you look at what happened to Jesus. So Jesus was the first consecrated one or the first anointed one in whom all anointings in the old covenant pointed. The very name Messiah in the Greek or Christos, for us Christ means anointed one or consecrated one. Jesus said in Luke 4, remember, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. The event Jesus referred to uh, in these words are his baptism in the River Jordan. When God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, Acts 10, 38. It is precisely from this anointing that the name Christ is derived. He's called Christ because he was anointed by the Father with the Holy Spirit. According to uh, Irenaeus, one of the early fathers, he said, it's an action that involves the whole Trinity. The Father anointed Jesus, the Son was anointed, and the Holy Spirit himself was the anointing. So what does um, all this mean? Um, and why was Jesus only consecrated at the age of 30, we see in the Scriptures? In, in Jesus' baptism, he was anointed and consecrated of head of his church in view of his mission he needed to fulfill. He received the anointing that he would transmit his anointing to his body. The same anointing that's on Jesus is the same anointing that's on you. Exactly the same. The church cannot do anything without the Holy Spirit. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you see in Scripture, are inseparable. Wherever Jesus is, the Holy Spirit is. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, Jesus is. That's why the Lordship of Jesus is very important. And as we come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has free reign to bring about the will of God on the earth. So the same anointing that was on Jesus, he was anointed and baptised with the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that he could give you what he had. Jesus already had the Holy Spirit when he was conceived. He was true God and true man. But his baptism and the anointing that the Father gave him was in view of you and me coming and the church. He received the anointing that he would transmit that anointing to his, to his church. That, that he was anointed Messiah receiving a kind of official investiture crowned as King and Lord. Now one of the things of the renewal movements, if you do any study, is this theme of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's if Jesus is exalted Lord. When Jesus is raised up as Lord, what it is, is that we give him back his place and his power. And when we, when we um, humble ourselves and come under the Lordship and authority of Christ, what happens in the church is we start to see the anointing and the presence and the power of God manifested in the church, carrying on the ministry of Jesus. And it's a hard thing that many people Many of us, if you're like me, fail to do to really make Jesus Christ Lord, really make His will the priority in my life. When we make His will the priority in our life, we see the freedom and the life of the Holy Spirit start to rule and reign through His people and through our lives. And we see ourselves radically set free and set free to bring, establish the kingdom under His Lordship. So this profound truth um, about the anointing, Candela Messer says this, uh, he says, this profound truth can be found in most of the ancient teachers of the faith, the fathers of the church. And he said, let's no longer be content with dull and devotional practices, but rather nourish ourselves with solid food. And here's some quotes from some of the fathers. Irenaeus, uh, sorry, Ignatius of Antioch said, the Lord received 
ointment on his head that he might breathe the odour of incorruptibility on the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God wants to breathe his life in us. That's how the church exists. For the life of God to be breathed into us. It's his presence, it's his anointing that comes on us and brings us to life. We assume a nature similar to that of the Son of God. Augustine said, the anointing is Christ and the church. It's one, it's not two. The witness of the Holy Spirit on the church is one voice with the church. When Peter and James went into the temple gate called Beautiful, and the man asked them for arms. They said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And the man walked. They did not pray because the witness of their voice was the same as the Holy Spirit. The same anointing that was on Jesus was in them. And the life of God came out of them to bring healing to that person. Now, it might not be healing for a person, but when we have that breath of incorruptibility breathed into us, our bodies come alive. Our spirits come alive. We're free from demonic power. We can move into our inheritance. We can start to call things that are not as though they were because now our voice is aligned to the presence of God within us. The presence of God within us. And God wants to bring us more fully and me for Molly, for, for Molly, for, for more fully into his anointing. We assume a nature to that of the Son of God. Cyril said the same thing happened to you when you were baptised. The same thing. The Holy Spirit that descended upon Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that came on you. Same Spirit like Christ. Augustine said, you have become Christ, like Christ. It's his anointing in the church. So Christianity isn't something that I do for a moral restraint, but it's a life I live through the presence of God within me that helps me keep his law. Amen? Okay. Ignatius of Antioch said, received anoint Jesus, the Lord received anointment on his head that he might breathe the odour of incorruptibility into the church. Now Irenaeus clarifies, he said, the Spirit of the Lord descended on Jesus and anointed him so that we drawing from the fullness of his anointing would be saved. Again, the presence of God brings us into salvation. The presence of God frees us. The presence of God frees us from sin. The presence of God frees us from the greatest moral evil, which is sin that holds us captive and holds us earthbound. God wants to lift us into His realm. where we start to move in His life and His salvation comes into us. Another great doctor of the church, uh, Athanasius expressed the same conviction. He said, It was for our sake that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in the Jordan. Same Holy Spirit, Christ in the church. It was for our sake that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the Jordan. It was for our sanctification that we might share in his anointing. And so that it might be said of us, do you not know that you are temples of God and that the Holy Spirit lives in you? Isn't that extraordinary? It's extraordinary that you are temples of the Holy Spirit, that I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit lives in me. He comes and lives in me. Another uh, Irenaeus said this too. He said, the Spirit, I'll just go back he, before then, sorry. Is, if the anointing of Christ was for us, why doesn't it come to the church immediately? Why is there a long interval we see between the time when Jesus received the Spirit at the Jordan and the time at Easter, at Pentecost, when he gave it to the disciples? Irenaeus, one of the fathers again, said this. He said, the Spirit needed to become accustomed to dwelling among men. He needed to find a place in which he could dwell. The Spirit was completely present in the purest humanity of Christ. That's why wherever Christ is exalted, the Holy Spirit is. Wherever the Lordship of Jesus Christ 
is the Holy Spirit is in power. The Holy Spirit needed to become accustomed to dwelling in, in, in a person and he found it in the purest humanity of Christ, the most purest saviour, Jesus. But he could not be poured out. The Spirit was completely present in the purest humanity of Christ, like perfume in an alabaster vase, but he could not be poured out until Christ had been glorified, John 7.39. In his passion, the alabaster vase was broken. That is, Jesus' humanity was broken. And the perfume filled the whole house, the church. See that? Jesus was glorified. He gave up his spirit in John 19, 30. And the scripture shows that the last breath of Jesus was the first, first breath of the church, the breath of God. Now, the challenge... For us is, is, are we hungry for the Holy Spirit? Do we really want the Holy Spirit? Do we really want the law of the Spirit of life to move in our lives? Or do we operate under the law of sin and death? What are we yielding to? Because God breathes the odour of incorruptibility in fullness on His church because His church is Christ in the earth. It's amazing. What happens is when Christ is exalted, in the earth, when Christ moves in in the earth, He starts to minister, and you start to see the ministry of Christ move, and His power is released, and His grace is released to restore us from sin, restore us from broken hearts, restore us, and bring healing and redemption. In His passion, the alabaster jars was broken. The last breath of Jesus became the first breath of the church. The very, Easter, very evening of Easter, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus came, the Holy Spirit couldn't come because there was three walls of separation between the Holy Spirit and us. Sin, our nature and death that came in as a result of the fall. There was three walls of division where the Holy Spirit didn't have access in the earth. We're very privileged people because we, we live in a time where the Holy Spirit has been poured out. Amen? Amen. We pour, live in a time where the presence of God is being poured out in the earth. But before Jesus came, there was this wall of separation. Holiness wasn't restored in the life of man before because the Holy Spirit couldn't come in because of what sin had done. Jesus tears down these three walls. Jesus tore down the first wall when he united within himself the divine nature and the human nature, the spirit and the flesh in his incarnation. So he tore down that first wall. He tore down the second wall when he died on the cross in expiation for our sin. He tore down the third wall when he was raised from the dead. And now there's no impediment for us, for you, to receive the anointing, the oil from the Holy Spirit. There's now no impediment for us to receive the oil of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus has been fully glorified, He's been endowed now with life-giving power and He confers it on His church if we want it. Remember, integrity wasn't restored. It's a choice of the will. Am I going to yield to the law of the spirit of life, the presence of God within me, or am I going to yield to the works of the flesh? That one, of the, the, one of the fathers, Irenaeus, says why people don't change is because we sympathise with our emotions and we sympathise with our fallen nature. And he said what happens here, we receive carnal Loss. So he never raised up. But he said when we, when we submit our souls to the Spirit of God, that's why worship is important, when we submit our souls to God, we're raised up like him. It's amazing. We, we assume this nature, the nature of Christ. Okay, point three is uh, Christians, the anointed ones. Now, so we talked about consecration, anointing. We talked about... Uh, Christ, the anointed one. Now, Christians, the anointed ones. Now, you might get the theme here. According to Cyril, just as Jesus became fully Christ, 
that is consecrated by his anointing in the baptism at Jordan, so too those who believe in him are called Christ. Christ. He said Christ back in the first part. But so too, according to Cyril, just as Jesus became fully Christ, that is consecrated. Remember, consecration is separation, separation from the world to worship, service. That's how you know if you're anointed. So you know if you're anointed, if you worship God and you serve. Worship is the integration of our soul under the Spirit of God. Then the life of God comes into our soul and it works out in love. It works out in my speech. It works out in how I dress. It works out in how I present myself because now I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. He's living in me. He's animating my body through my spirit. He animates my mind, will and emotions and then he animates my body. And Paul says uh, in Colossians that he labours with all his energy that so powerfully works in him. Not his energy. As his soul was yielded, his spirit was yielded, the life of God energised his spirit to carry on the kingdom of God. So that's what happened. So according to Cyril of Jerusalem, we are anointed. We become Christ or Christian through their anointing by the anointing. By this anointing, Christians participate in the anointing of Christ. For the early church fathers, the name Christian did not primarily mean followers of a doctrine of Christ as it did for the pagans who first gave them the name at Antioch, Acts 11.26. Rather, the name Christian meant anointed consecration in imitation of Christ. Again, it's this consecration, separation, surrendering my life, being filled with his power and his grace. Um, According to one of the fathers, we are called Christian because we have been anointed with the oil of God. The result of all this is that we have in ourselves the same spirit that was in Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. Is that bad news? Is that good news? The Holy Spirit whom we have received is indeed the third person of the Trinity. But he has become, through the incarnation, the Spirit of the Son. God sent the Spirit of the Son, his Son, into our hearts. Galatians 4, 6. We have received the Spirit of the Son and not any other spirit. When we come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we receive his Spirit. We receive his presence. The Holy Spirit permeates us. With the anointing of Christ. Therefore, as Paul says, we become the aroma of Christ. We we look like him. We smell like him. Hopefully, (laughs) we smell like him. So what a joy to think that the same spirit who is in Jesus during his days on earth is in me. The one who Basil, St. Basil called his inseparable companion is now my inseparable companion, the sweet guest of my soul. That's what he says. He calls him. Because of this consecration, we have received a mark in the deepest part of our being, a mysterious seal, t- tells us in Ephesians, engraved by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Because of that seal, we are made in the image of God and in the likeness of Christ. And my fourth point, and I'm coming, uh, this is the last point. The anointing, when God anoints us with the Holy Spirit, the anointing is not an end in itself. So the anointing is not a fuzzy feeling. It's not, you know, something that we, you know, I mean, it can be a fuzzy feeling, but it's not a fuzzy feeling. It's not, um, it's not just a healing either. Or it's not, um, again, it's not, a, it's not someone speaking, although it can be, Someone can speak or someone can lead or someone can do that under the anointing, but it's not those things. Um, With the anointing or consecration, it's not an end in itself. Someone is always anointed for something. When God anoints you, he anoints you for a purpose. Now, this is how the anointing is activated because, again, it comes back to the will. Now, many, if you're like me, you want the anointing, but you don't want to do what he asks you to do. You want the power, but you really don't want to change. You want to be delivered, but you don't want to change your life. And that's contrary to consecration. Because consecration is set apart. Lordship of Jesus, worship, 
service. It's a setting apart uh, um, from the world unto him as Lord. And when that happens, when consecration happens, the anointing moves in for you and the anointing is never an end in itself. It releases you for a purpose. And that's where the hinge is, is what you want. Is if you want the anointing, there's no measure of it being poured out because Jesus died on a cross for it. And in fact, the Father, when you see what, what Jesus did at the cross, the Father is longing to pour out his Holy Spirit in the earth. He's longing for it. Jesus, because Jesus paid the price for it. So we're anointed for always for a purpose. Why are Christians anointed? Again, look, let's look at Jesus. Jesus was first anointed as king to fight against Satan and establish the kingdom of God. And there's many scriptures we could go through, but I won't. Secondly, Jesus was anointed prophet to bring good news to the poor. And again, there's many scriptures. And finally, Jesus was anointed priest, both through his incarnation and baptism, to offer himself as a sacrifice. This is one we get stuck on. I don't really want to offer myself as a sacrifice. As a sacrifice, um, Jesus offered himself to God to purify our consciences from acts that lead to death, Hebrews 9, 14. So those, uh, those appointed for the anointing or consecration essentially belong to three categories, kings, priests and prophets. So the anointing we receive is this like triplicate anointing. You're anointed in Christ as kings, prophets and priests. So for Christians, so now for Christians, in our kingly consecration, we're anointed to fight against what? Demonic power, yes, and sin in our lives. So God anoints us and he drafts us into a battle where we are anointed to overcome demonic power and sin and to establish the kingdom of God. And everything expresses itself under, as we come into that kingly anointing, everything expresses itself under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So if we want to do what we want to do and we want to move in the anointing, we won't receive it. Because the anointing, the Holy Spirit is free, but the anointing comes at a tremendous price. Everything else, our salvation is free. Jesus won it at the cross. But the anointing, to move in the power of the anointing, comes at a price because it's activated by what we choose. So if we want to move in kingship and we want to take on demonic power over our family, we want to have power over sin, what happens is it comes as we come in under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now coming under the Lordship of Jesus Christ is where I, all the major things I have in my life, I submit it to His will. And his lordship, I pray it through. And as I align myself to his will and my will, I see the power of God move in my life. The second thing, those, um, the second thing we're anointed with is prophet. In the beginning, oh, sorry, is uh, as prophet. Now, I just, uh, as prophet, we're called to proclaim the word of God. Now, an interesting scripture is in John 15, 26 and 27. It says about the Holy Spirit. It says, But when the counsellor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me and you also are my witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. Acts 5.32 also says, We are witnesses to these things and so is the Holy Spirit. So this does not actually mean two witnesses. It means one witness. What the apostles did, what, what, what Jesus is talking about, is that we lend our voice to the Spirit of God. And I re recall when I talked about when Peter and John went into the temple gate called Beautiful. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. Their voices were aligned to the power of God, to the life of God. They were incarnated. See the Holy Spirit came in. Flesh and spirit, we're flesh and spirit. The life of God came into them and the life of God spoke out of them. 
One great uh, person who I love is Smith Wigglesworth. He was a great plumber above many things. But sometimes he wouldn't even pray for people. You know, when he, people came to prayer, he would just speak because his voice was aligned to the Holy Spirit. And one famous story is when a man came to, or he stayed at a man's house, a curate, an angling a minister's house, and he had no feet. Do you know the story? He had no feet. And uh, as he was having dinner with him that night, he couldn't help but think of the man's feet. He had no feet. And he told the man over dinner, he said, tomorrow go to the shoe shop and buy a pair of shoes. And the minister said to him, he didn't pray, he was aligned to the Holy Spirit. This is what it is to be a prophet. It's what you're yielding to, remember, where the integrity is. Are we yielding to ourselves or are we yielding to God? So what he did, he just told the man to go to the shoe shop and buy a pair of shoes. And the minister thought he was joking. But because he knew he was a man of God and he knew that he had a healing ministry, he thought, I will do what he says. So the next morning he went to the shoe shop and he walked into the shoe store and the assistant came to him, a young man, and said to him, what would you like? And he said, a pair of shoes. And he looked down at his stumps and he thought he was joking. And he said, no, I do. I really want a pair of shoes. And he says, what size shoes, sir? And he didn't have any feet. And he says, size eight, what colour shoes? Black. So the the assistant went away, bought his shoes back. As he bought his shoes back, as he put his stump in a shoe, a foot grew. And as he put his stump in the other shoe, a foot grew. That's what it is to be a prophet. And this is what the scripture says here when we read it. Sometimes we can miss it. But when the counsellor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. Remember, we assume a nature similar to that of? Richard Martin, no. (laughs) Christ is in me, in fullness. Who am I more aware of? We assume a nature. That's who's in you, Christ. Now, you might see yourself. When I look at myself in the mirror, I might see myself. But there's a superior power in me, the law of the spirit of life, who is the presence of God, or the law of sin. And death, death keeps me earthbound. Jesus lifts me into the heavenly realms. So here's the scripture that he says, But when the counsellor comes, him I will send from the Father, even the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, who will bear witness? He will. He will bear witness to me. And you, all, you also are my witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. Now the witness is one voice. That's, that's what Jesus did when he destroyed the first um, separation. Remember, I, I read the first thing that stopped the Holy Spirit was our nature. Jesus took on our nature in the incarnation. Now we're incarnational with the Holy Spirit living in us. Wow. That's why you're all Christ. Yes. <laughs> you're all Christ. Christ lives in us with resurrection power. He ascended to the Father. He poured out all life-giving power. He poured it out. He conferred it on His church. Augustine said, Christ and the church are one. Oh, wow, how boring's church. <laughs> My goodness. Hey, hey, what was it? Ignatius of Antioch said, he breathed the out of incorruptibility on his church. The church needs to come alive in resurrection power. But it's by the will. What do you yield to? Am I full of my, aware of myself when I look in the mirror? Or am I aware of Christ who's in me? Do I align myself now? Now you understand what it is to be a prophet. You align yourself to the Word of God, the one witness of the Holy Spirit. But do I align myself with His Word or do I align myself with the words that are speaking in my head of the flesh, of the carnal nature? Do I align myself with the truth of the Word of God or do I align myself with, I'm no good, I'm hopeless, I can't do it. What do I align myself to? Now the Holy Spirit comes in us with that anointing of prophet to to establish His life in us so that I can hear the Word of the Lord. Now, when I assume a nature similar to that of the Son of God, I become like in nature. Now, what God does, He infuses in my soul this gift of faith. 
And what faith is, faith isn't just reason trying to understand the Scriptures, understanding Christ as an historical figure. Yeah, I think He's real. I'll put my faith in that. That's not faith, what the Scripture says. That's a point of reason. But faith is infused in my soul by the Holy Spirit. And what it allows me to do, it allows me to participate in the very life of God. And as I participate in the very life of God, I start to see things as Jesus sees things. Isn't that incredible? That's why Smith could say to the man, go to the shop and buy a pair of shoes. He didn't have a big prayer meeting. He didn't get super spooky and go sha da da ba ba and all that and pray. I mean, you could do that if that's what God asked you to do, but he didn't do that. He just said, go and buy a pair of shoes because he was aligned. That's a prophetic anointing that was on his life. Again, the first one is kingly anointing. The kingly anointing. If you yield to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you'll have victory over sin. If you yield to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you have victory over demonic power. In fact, the kingly anointing is that you're called, you're drafted into a battle to bring down your spiritual inheritance over your life and over those around you. That's the anointing, the kingly anointing. Now, the third anointing that we're called to is the final one. And this is one a lot of people move away from. I do too. That's... uh, a priest. And a priest is called to offer sacrifice. And a priest is called to give everything. When the priests were called in the Old Testament, they were separated, they were consecrated specially. Again, they were consecrated for what? Worship. What are we worshipping? If I ask myself, what is number one in my life? That's what I worship. It's a, spirit, uh, uh, it's a, a scriptural principle Whatever's number one in my life, that's what I give assent to. The first commandment in the Old Testament was put no other gods before you because it's a primary calling. If God is primary in my life, I start to receive all of his life in my soul. Whatever I put in my life before God, I receive. That tells me who I am. Now, if I, it could even be good things. If my wife was first in my life and not Christ, what would happen was she would tell me who my identity was. And if she wasn't nice, but she's beautiful, if she wasn't nice, that would, that would dictate to me what I am. But Christ wants to be Lord in our lives so that he can tell us who we are. He can tell us who we are, the dignity of who we are as persons. And that's what it is to be a priest. So to be consecrated, it's a... It's, um, or to be consecrated as priest, Paul says in uh, Romans 12.1, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Now, the word body there means all of your life. So we're talking here about the anointing, what it is to be anointed. We're consecrated, we're set apart, and the anointing we're anointed with is priest, prophet and king. This one of priest is the anointing's there for you to be able to offer all of your life. Everything, your strengths, your weaknesses, all of your life. As you do that, as you offer yourself as a priest in sacrifice, offer God all your life. What happens is there's an integration that happens from the presence of God into your spirit. And God's Spirit starts to permeate your soul and He starts to bring freedom into your body even through healing. That's the order. That's what He does. But when we take back and we say, oh, I want the anointing, God doesn't mind that either. He doesn't mind that. But I'm talking about what it is to be anointed. When we decide to make a choice and to offer ourselves to Him, the Holy Spirit never misses out. Because you've assumed a nature similar to that of the Son of God and He wants to conform you to the image of the Son, it tells us in Romans 8. He wants to conform us into the image and likeness of His Son. Now, I'm going to finish, Joe. I've finished, 45. I've got a bit more, but I won't. So in conclusion, I want to just ask, you know, a, a couple of questions and we'll go back into worship. Are, are we moving in our authority. So you think in your life, are you moving in your authority as king? Are you building your life in the spirit as king over your life? 
Or are you building a life for yourself? What you want, what you think, what you feel? Or are you building your life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Because when that happens, and that's a process, but talking about the anointing, as we do that, we start to see the king comes to rule. Now what happens is when we start to do that, we start to see the ministry of Christ. He starts to minister in his power. John Wimber tells this amazing story once. The Lord spoke to him on a plane and the Lord said to him, and he had a healing ministry and in his ministry, he felt the Lord come to him and say, I've seen your ministry, John. And John sort of felt pretty happy because he'd seen his ministry. And he felt pretty chuffed about it. And then he was thinking in his head, oh, what do you think about it, Lord? And the Lord said, your ministry is like this. It's not very good, he said. And he goes, now I want to show you my ministry. I want to show you my ministry. Now, how you see God's Christ's ministry is under um, the kingship, under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Okay, the second thing, the question we can ask ourselves as prophet, what are we lending our voices to? Are we lending our voices to the kingdom of God? Or are we lending our voices to what is it? Is it accusation? Are we? Is it hatred? Is it envy? Is it pride? Is it uh, the, the works of the flesh that Paul talks about in Galatians 5? What are we lending our voices to? Are we aligning our voices to the word of God? What are we, what are we listening to? The scripture says faith comes by hearing. What are we hearing? And usually what we hear in our subconscious is what we do, what we practice. But what are we aligning ourselves to? So that's another way. Are we lending our voices to the Holy Spirit? Are we lending them to ourselves? And the third question we can ask ourselves as priests, is worship and service of God the number one priority in our lives to release the anointing? Is worship, remember worship is the integration of our our spirit, soul and body, subordinate to God's spirit? And then his life starts to flow. Is worship the number one priority and service of God? Oh, sorry, as priests, is worship and service the number one priority in our lives? Or is it what I worship? What do I worship? And what does God want me to worship? 